Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. That in your word we find life and hope and, and purpose. And I pray this morning as we uh, unpack your word for us today that we can truly understand your calling for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think there must have been some mistakes with regards to the, the readings up there. Uh, but the reading that was read was the reading we're going to look at uh, this morning. Uh, for the month of January, we've sort of been going through the, um, the readings from the lectionary. And the lectionary is sort of like the Anglican, uh, it's not sort of, but it's the Anglican uh, book that gives you all the readings for the whole year. Uh, and it's sort of the readings that's done right across the, the, the country. Uh, with, if the Anglican Church is following the lectionary and today's readings, uh, was 1 Corinthians 7, 29 to 31, and Mark 1, 14 to 20. In the Greek, there are actually uh, two words that is used for timing. Uh, you have chronos, uh, which we, we get the word chronology or chronological, and it's talking about time as a sequence, minutes, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, years, you know, and so on. And so when we say we meet, at St. Tim's for Sunday worship at 10, 15 a.m. That's Kronos. It's a, it's a time we meet every, every Sunday at this time. Or if I say I've got a lunch appointment uh, on Tuesday at 1, uh, that is Kronos timing. Uh, so it's something that is fits into your diary, that is sequential, that is chronological, uh, and that happens on the, on, on the day. Uh, the other Greek word is the word kairos, and that sort of signifies an opportune moment or a, a critical, or crucial time uh, in, in Kronos. Uh, and it's, it's something that happens at a special moment. So, for example, when we say we have missed the boat, what does it mean? <laughs> it, it simply means we missed that, that opportune moment, that, 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 chron, uh, that Kairos timing. And, and so that's, that's, that's Kairos, that's the opportune moment, that's the critical moment. And in the Bible, Kairos moments are often God moments. So in, in today's readings, the time is mentioned. Uh, and so, for example, uh, in the Gospel reading, uh, we have Jesus saying, the time is, is here, the time is here, the time is, is, is present. And, and he's referring to this term, Kairos. And when in, the chronic, in, in 1 Corinthians, when he says, the time is short, again, it's referring to Kairos. And, and so I want to suggest to you this, this morning that as we look at these two scripture passages, uh, there is a, a clarity that God has this Kairos season uh, with a start and with a finish. And this Kairos season is critical, it's, it's crucial, because during this time, that is the only time we have a chance to repent and believe the good news. Because once this Kairos moment is over, that's it. There is no other chance for repentance and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so that's, that's the, the, the Kairos moment, uh, the Kairos season that, that we are living in. And this is the Kairos season that both the Gospel and the Corinthian uh, passage is talking about. So the topic for today is following Christ and making Him known. So God has established a, a Kairos season. So when Jesus said the, the time is here, for the Kairos moment, that, that, that this ordained time of God has now arrived, He is saying all the prophecies, all the promises that have taken place in the Old Testament about the Messiah, about the coming of God's kingdom, about God's kingdom rule, God's kingdom reign, about the kingdom of peace and joy and love, where people will dwell in unity, that there will be such a, a beautiful picture of, of what you and I would, would long for, this utopia uh, that is promised in the Old Testament. Jesus is saying the Kairos season, the Kairos moment has now arrived. And, and so we look through some of the verses in the New Testament, and for example, in, in Hebrews 1, it talks about this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors, to the prophets, at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. So the, the writer to the Hebrews is, 
is saying to, to, the, to, to his readers who are Jews reading this message that this Messiah that all these Old Testament prophets were talking about is now being fulfilled in Jesus. He is now the voice of God. He is now the word of God. He is now the one bringing in this, this, um, this Kairos season of God. Another one in Galatians 4. When the set time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So when this Kairos time had fully come, God says, this is the start of this Kairos season. I'm sending my Son, born, under, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are bound by the law, in order that they can, be, they can receive sonship, adoption of, of son to sonship. So in other words, this kind of season is a time God sent His Son so that you and I can be adopted as children of God. And then when Jesus started His ministry, He went to the synagogue and He got the scroll and, and He looked through the scroll and He chose this passage where He was quoting from Isaiah. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and here the year is not a literal year, but the start of the season, to proclaim that this is the season of God's favor, this is the Kairos moment of God's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, the scripture is fulfilled. In your hearing. So when Jesus says that the time is now, the time is here, he's saying this this Kairos season is, is beginning, it's starting, this, this uh, season of God's grace, the season of God's favor where you and I have a chance to be adopted as children of God, the time is now being fulfilled. We now go to the second reading, in, well, actually it was the first reading, but uh, 1 Corinthians 7. And in 1 Corinthians 7 and in verse 29, um, Paul writes, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. So, to put it into context, Paul was talking about marriage, divorce, singleness, and he was saying how, if, you know, if you're single, uh, don't seek to get married because in single you have more opportunities to, to serve the Lord, to give yourself to God's service. If you're married, you've got other responsibilities. So, you know, it's good to be single. And then he says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. So he's using here again the word kairos. So what, what is the meaning when he says that? And, and if you go on to, to verse 31, in the same context, he tells us why. He says, for this world in its present form is passing away. So while Jesus was saying the time has started, uh, and all the prophecies of the Old Testament is starting, Paul was now saying, actually this time that started with Jesus coming and proclaiming the good news is actually short. And this, 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 this window of opportunity is not one that's going to last forever and ever and ever. It's actually a short window. A, a, a window that eventually will come to an end because the world in its present form, the world with all its values, the world with all its principles and rules and everything that governs the way the world functions is going to come to an end. Christ is going to come again. And he's going to come like, like a thief in the night, as, as Paul would, and, and the writer to the Hebrews would say, or sorry, Peter would say. He would come as a thief of the night when you least expect it, that's the end. And so we cannot just sit back and think, things are going to keep going on and on and on. You know, he hasn't come yet. It's, it's 2021. Um, you know, the 24th of, 24th, listen to it, 24th of Rachel. Anyway, it is January, and, and you know, he's not yet come, we've got a, maybe another 5 to 10 years, let's continue planning to, to live life as long as you want, and suddenly, Christ will come, like a thief in the night. Even uh, when we die, not, no one will know. We cannot assume that tomorrow is going to happen. None of us can. And so there's this time of, 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 of this time of season, this time uh, that of grace, of God's favor, is very short, and unless we take opportunity of head, we, we may miss it, we may die, or Christ may come again. So we read, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 
Now, brothers and sisters, about times and days, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Whilst people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Uh, Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. So, so what we're seeing in these two readings for, that are set for lectionary, we, we look at these two readings, and he's telling us this, that when Christ came and walked on earth and started his ministry, he says the kingdom of God is here, that the time, this Kairos moment is started. Uh, he was heralding in the year of the Lord's favor, the season of God's grace. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 says, don't think that this grace will last forever. Don't think that the season of favor, of God's favor, is just going to continue as long as possible. That it is short and, and everything in this world will pass away. So there is a start and there is a finish in this Kairos moment, in this season of God's grace, this season of God's favor. So what are we meant to do during this time? God calls us to respond to Him and His mission during this Kairos season. A couple of points I want to mention. Firstly, that we need to let God's kingdom perspective take a hold of you. Jesus says in Mark 1 and verse 15, The time has come, He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So the appropriate response in this Kairos season, this short Kairos season that you and I are in, the appropriate response is repentance and faith, believing, trusting in, in the good news of the gospel. What do we mean by the word repent? Repentance is more than just saying the sinner's prayer. And, you know, when we have an evangelistic rally, you bring everyone up, and then you ask them to repeat after us, and having that sinner's prayer. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, except we don't actually find the sinner's prayer in the Bible. Uh, no, no way in the Bible we find them having to say the sinner's prayer. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. It helps us to, to get ourselves right with God. But, but sometimes we miss the point. That we say the sinner's prayer, and think that's it. We're saying, let's go back to life as per normal. And that is not repentance. Because the repentance, the Greek word metanoia, actually means a change of mind and a change of direction. And it's pointless saying a sinner's prayer and then going back and living life as if nothing has happened. We don't go back living life as we live it like others in the world. And, and that is not repentance because repentance is recognizing that there must be an awareness of this new way of living. This, this good news is of, king, of the kingdom is this new way of living, a new way of living that helps us experience God's values, kingdom values in our own life. So we are turning our back on the way we used to live, the way the world tells us how we should live, the world tells us what is right or wrong. We turn our back on that to accept and acknowledge that this is God's kingdom values this is the new way of living. And that is why Paul in, in Romans 12 says, you know, do not be conformed by the world, or do not let the world dictate how you should live, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, there is a new way of living, and repentance is taking hold of this new way of living, this kingdom lifestyle, and saying, this is now the way that I'm going to live. The world is not going to tell me how I'm going to live. The world, but God is going to show me and tell me how I should live. God's word is the one that directs my life. Not, not the world and not the ways of the world or not what the world tells me to accept. It's what God's word tells me to accept. And so that's the first thing. That's repentance is acknowledging that there is a new way of life for us, for you and for, I, and for me. And, and we need to take hold of that and say, this is now the way I live. 
I'm going to turn my back on the world and my old way of living to embrace this new way of living. But there's also the belief. And in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, there's, a defin- there's an explanation of what faith is or what belief is. It's the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So, so we, we accept and embrace this new way of living and, and we, we already start putting that into practice even though we do not see the reality of that happening in the world. And so we are still trusting God that at some point this new way of living is going to become the reality. Not this world. This world is not the true reality. This world will pass away. But this new reality which we start living in the here and now will eventually become the the true reality. And that is when the new heaven and the new earth is established. And and until then, we're going to still lay hold of this new way of living, even though we are ridiculed, even though the world may call us names and give us labels, we are still holding on to this new way of living because we have chosen to turn our back on the ways of this world. And this is what God calls us to live, and, and our response should be in the season of grace. And so we look at Acts chapter 17. This is where um, Paul was giving this sermon uh, on Mars Hill. And, and look at what he says. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human designs and skills. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now, in this kairos moment, now, He commands all people everywhere to repent, to turn away from all the idols that govern our lives. And it doesn't have to be uh, gold and silver idols, it can be anything that we, we hold on to, our career, our, our ambitions, our wealth, our whatever. We can hold on to that and that becomes an idol. And in the past, God overlooked it, but in this period of grace, where He calls us to repent and, and, and hold on to the one true God, He says, everyone to repent. And notice this, He has set a day when this day of, when the season of grace will come to an end. He sets a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And so on Easter, when we celebrate the resurrection, it's the proof that this risen Christ will come on a set day when this season of grace, this Cairo season, comes to an end. And then comes judgment, where he will judge the world. And so the call for us in this Kairos season is to embrace what it means to be a, a, a Christian, a believer, turning away from the world and not letting the world dictate how we should live, but embracing and holding on to kingdom values, kingdom principles, things that God has called you and I to hold on to. And then to become the most important thing during the season of grace. But secondly, he calls us to follow Christ and be involved in his mission. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a relationship with Christ. This, this whole thing about embracing this new way of living, this kingdom values, this kingdom principles, requires us to make a decision. If we want to hold on to this kingdom principles, then we need to let go of everything that we hold on to us, hold on to us, and and hold dear to to ourselves. We need to give that up, we need to let go of those things in order to follow Christ. And so when um, uh, when Christ called Simon and Andrew to leave their nets, that was their livelihood, their nets, their business, their career. He says, leave that behind to follow me. In other words, the, the decision to follow Christ must be so compelling that you would not want your career to stand in the way of you following Christ. And then for James and John, as you read in the passage, the call was for them to leave their father and and, and this business. And so they were leaving someone who was dear to them, their father, and what the father expected of the sons. They were deciding 
to, to not let friendly commitments uh, affect their decision to follow Christ. And so, so the call of Christ, come follow me, has to be so compelling that it would cause us to want to, to walk away from everything that we hold dear to us, the idols in our life, to, to, to decide to walk away and say, Christ, I want to follow you. It has to be so compelling that, that nothing else matters, that only Christ and what he wants matters. And we see that right through scripture. We see that in Abraham, hearing the call of God, or Moses, or Isaiah, or the, the disciples, or the early church, or, or Paul. All of them heard the call of, of, of God. And their call was so compelling that they were willing to lay aside all the other idols that was, that was controlling them in order to follow Christ. I remember when I first encountered Christ in 1978, the call was so compelling that, that I wanted to just follow Christ. Uh, and, and I wanted to, to make Him the Lord of my life. It was so real, it was so clear, it was so uh, specific that I, I decided that I would follow Christ. And, and that was what I did in 1978. And then uh, Joy and I met, and, and, and in front of our wedding, we, we chose this verse in Psalm 48. And in verse 14, This God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide, even to the end. And so, excuse me, for, so, since 78, so it's 40 plus years, uh, it has been such an adventure. It, everything wasn't always a bed of roses. It was up and down. There were a lot of challenges. But, but we saw so many wonderful things happening when we decided that God has to matter, that it is God's will, God's purpose that should control us. And so that is something Joy and I had to do. I had to do when I first encountered God. Joy had to do that. As a couple, we had to do that. We had to count the cost. That if we are truly wanting to embrace this new way of living, and even though it's not a reality in this world as yet, and even though we would face ridicule and laughter and, 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 and condemnation, we would still hold on to it because that is what matters. And that's what Jesus was saying, that if you want to follow me, this is what it takes. And unless you prepare to count the cost, it would be better not to follow me. And so time and time again, Jesus talks in a negative sense about Hey, don't follow me. He was not into crowds. He was not into multitudes. He was into a group of people who have counted the cost and says, I want to make this my everything. And so in Luke, uh, for example, in Luke 14, um, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, says, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Verse 27 of Luke 14, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33, in the same way those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. It's like I said, Jesus had this big crowd and each time he made a statement, some people left and then he made another statement and another, people, another group of people left and, and then the final statement. It's, it's, it's Jesus saying, look, this is what it means to follow Christ. It's about putting God's kingdom first. And everything about God's kingdom should control our life. And everything else will then fall into place. And unless we can count, we can, unless we have counted the cost and have decided that this is what I want, we will not live the life that God wants us to live. What if what Jesus says in Matthew 7 is true? That not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father. I, I believe it's true, but if that is true, there could be many people who may call Jesus Lord, but might miss out entering the kingdom of heaven. That's scary, isn't it? That's scary. And it says, unless I know you, you will not enter my kingdom. And how do we know God? It's through doing the will of the Father. And that's, that's the call, this high standard of following Christ, that, that we want to know Christ by doing the will of His Father. It's not 
It's true about doing all these wonderful things around the church, plus those are not, not good things to do. But it's about doing what God wants, fulfilling His will, counting the cost. And that is what Paul, I believe, is trying to say in 1 Corinthians 7 in the, in the passage that was read to us. Um, in, in verse 17, just, just before the passage that was read, Paul says this, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I laid out in all the churches. So what he's saying, and, and you know, whether you're married, or whether you're single, or whether you're divorced, whether you are a Jew who is been circumcised, whether you are a Gentile, not circumcised, whether you are, and I'm just adding this, a rich person or a poor person, whether you are white, brown, yellow, black, green, whatever, uh, whatever status God has placed you, you are called to live as a believer. And that's, that's the call for all of us. So that's in verse 17. And then he comes to uh, verse 29 to 31 that was read to us, and I'm, I'm not going to read it to you. But in that passage, what was Paul trying to say? You know, when Paul says, from now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. What does it mean? Do, do we, does, is he saying that we should neglect our wives, or wives should not neglect their <coughs> husbands, or you should walk away from your marriage and just forget that you were married? Is that what Paul is saying here? No, he's not encouraging husbands and wives to, to walk a separate way. What he's saying is that don't let your marital responsibilities stand in the way of your primary responsibilities to be a follower of Christ. And so that's why he says being single is great because you don't have any marital responsibilities. You can be totally committed to Christ. But because you're married, you have marital responsibilities. But if that marital responsibility take the place of your primary responsibility to follow Christ, that is wrong. And that's what he's saying here. That your primary responsibility to follow Christ should not be pushed aside in order for you to do your marital responsibilities. You have marital responsibilities, take that seriously, but it should not take the place of your primary responsibility to follow Christ. Then he goes, those who mourn should live as if they are not, and those who are happy to live as if they are not. What he's saying, he's not saying that you should stop being happy or stop being sad. He's not saying ignore the emotions that are in you. But what he's saying is don't let your emotions pull you away from your primary responsibility of following Christ. Yes, it's okay to be emotional. Yes, you may wake up in the morning and say, I'm just too tired to come to church. <laughs> but your primary responsibility is not how you feel, but your primary responsibility is to follow Christ. When he says, those who buy something to not hold on to those things tightly, or those who use the things of this world not to get caught up in the things of this world, what he's saying is, don't let your life be one focused on pursuing the things of the world or in, in, in getting those things of the world. Don't just let that take all your time and energy and attention. Don't let that pull, let that pull you away from your primary responsibility of following Christ. That is what he's calling us to do. So what he's saying is come the cost. If you want to be a follower of Christ, then make sure that becomes your primary responsibility and the kingdom becomes your primary focus and to make sure that during the season of, of, uh, of grace the gospel is proclaimed here in this place. And so I just want to end with these two points. What does it mean for you to follow Christ in 2021 and beyond? That firstly, we need to take our calling to be a follower of Christ seriously. It's so easy to just add that to all the labels that describes you. A husband, a wife, a child, a worker, a student, a Christian, and we, we add that all the labels. But that is not what it means to be a follower of Christ. Follower of Christ means we 
have committed ourselves, we have counted the cost, and we're going to bring God's kingdom values into our home. We're going to bring God's kingdom values into my workplace. We're going to bring God's kingdom values into my schools. I'm going to bring God's kingdom values into the community. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to change lives, to transform people. We need to take that seriously. And then secondly, to fulfill your calling and ministry in and through this local community of faith. Now there are two kinds of churches in the Bible. Um, the Bible talks about the universal church and in our creed, the Nicene Creed, we talk about the Holy, Apostolic, uh, Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. That is the universal church, the Bride of Christ. Holy, that, 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 been, that their sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. Catholic, not that it's Roman Catholic, but Catholic that, that's in that it's universal. And, and apostolic, in effect, that is historical, originated, originated from the apostles. That this is the universal church, the bride of Christ. But it also talks about the local church, the church in Galatia, the church in Ephesus, the church in Colossae. Uh, and, and, and there's a whole lot of local churches uh, that met in different homes as well, right through Acts. And that's the local church. And every believer, I, I come across people who say, I belong to the universal church, but they don't belong to a local church. And, and you can't be part, well, you are part of the universal church, but the local church is not an option. I want to repeat that. The local church is not an option we can choose to follow or not. God wants us to function in a community of faith. Why? Because I need my brothers and sisters to encourage me. I have gifts to offer, they have gifts to offer, and together we function as a community of faith. And so it is so important for us to be part of this local community. And for us here is this parish uh, made up of multiple congregations, but, but we are this one church. God has placed us here in Herod Birdside during this Kairos season in order that we can proclaim the gospel to those around us. Exciting, um, sitting in the finance committee meeting yesterday because of generous giving to be able to put aside funds for youth and young adults for the next few years. That's great. And that's what it means to be part of this local church where we give in order to keep the ministry going. And I, 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 I'm blessed by the generosity of so many of you. But that's what it means to be part of this local church, to say, I'm going to give so that we can keep this gospel alive in this place. We are, the lighthouse has been taken away, but we are a lighthouse in this area, so that through our giving, through our prayers, through our service, others can come to know God in this Cairo season, because when the time comes to an end, that is it. And so we need to be committed. And as we enter 2021, and we look ahead, how are we willing to be part of this exciting journey of, of, of bringing God's kingdom values in a world that is broken? We sang about it, a world that is dark, a world that is, that is totally separated from God, and for us to be that light of hope in this world. Let's pray. And we find out to just pray as we start 2021 and, and these readings that have been set by the Anglican Church for this for this uh, for this Sunday for today is so appropriate for us to, to know that this kind of season, this season of God's favor is so short, and that there is any time we can either die and leave this world or Christ will come again. Lord, I just can't help but think of that parable of the ten virgins, five were ready, five were not. Help us, Lord, not to be the ones that will not be ready, that when we come, we miss out. Father, I just pray, I just pray for each one of us that we will come to cause and say, this is it, that we want in this 2021, the, the annual plan, the, the theme to really set low. Lord, that is our desire to take this seriously and, and to work towards growth, spiritual numerical, because Lord, we will desire to see people saved. And so Father, I just commit ourselves afresh to you, take our lives and let it be consecrated, Lord, to be. In Jesus' name we pray.